In today's episode, we're talking about sports tech and venture capital, leadership and truth speaking, as well as broadcast and the future of fan engagement. From Engagement, I'm David Millay, and this is Flip the Switch. Quick plug before we get to our guest introduction today. If you're focused on guest experience or employee experience, definitely go check out our email newsletter. As we work with pro teams and college athletic departments around the country, we're taking the lessons that we learn from our experiments and our projects, and we're putting those insights into the newsletter. A couple of times per week, you'll get everything from the articles and content that are inspiring us to innovate, as well as new tools that we're using and loving. If you get value from this show, you're going to love the newsletter. To sign up, head to engagementpartners.com backslash newsletter. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Flip the Switch, where we sit down with leaders in customer experience and employee experience, and we try to figure out what are the trends that they are paying attention to? What are the experiments that they're running? Um, what are the principles that have driven success in their careers? And we take all those insights and we apply them to the world of sports and entertainment. Uh, oftentimes we have leaders in sports and entertainment on the show. And that's the case today where we've got John Kozner with us. Now, if you don't recognize the name, John is the head of an organization called Kozner Media now. Uh, and he really created this in the last few years after he left ESPN in 2017. At ESPN is really where he spent the majority of his time in his career, 21 years with the company. Uh, and in his 21 years at ESPN, John really helped build ESPN into the world's leading digital sports destination. So this is everything from short and long-term or long-form editorial content, uh, streaming, social media, podcasting, fantasy sports, direct-to-consumer Everything that John was focused on at ESPN was really around the digital side of things and, and moving ESPN past Bleacher Report and all the other early players in the digital sports space uh, and really capitalizing uh, on helping them become the worldwide leader in digital uh, as, as well as traditional broadcast. Now, uh, some of the other stops that John has made along his career would be Sports Illustrated, the NBA, CBS Sports, NBC Sports. Um, he's really had an interesting career, though, in the last four years, which is where we spend the majority of the conversation uh, together with John today. Uh, one of those stops was co-managing micromanagement ventures with David Stern. Together, John and, and David founded Micromanagement Ventures, which was a portfolio of sports tech startups focused on media, betting, and player health. Um, and, and now, John is really spending a lot of time in the advisory space, advising different sports organizations on the future, on really how to engage better with their customers, um, how to grow, uh, and taking all the lessons that he's learned from his illustrious career and, and helping these organizations now apply those principles. So, that makes for a really interesting episode for us today in the podcast because we're going to get in an hour what a lot of organizations uh, are paying John to do now, which is advising them and giving them lessons from his career. So without further ado, uh, let's jump into this wide-ranging episode with John Kozner. John, welcome to the show. Excited to have you. Good morning. How are you? Doing really well. Well, let's jump right in. Um, I, I, we can cover so many different things in this podcast together, but I, I want to start with one of my favorite stories that I've ever heard you tell, um, which is around one of your most recent projects, and that is uh, the venture sports tech venture firm that you created with David Stern, uh, and it was called Micromanagement Ventures. So talk to us a little bit about the story behind the name of Micromanagement Ventures and a little bit about what you guys actually invested in uh, together. So thanks for having me today. My career has always been in sports media. Uh, I worked, started my career at CBS Sports, and then I joined the NBA, where I was in charge of broadcasting during the Dream Team era. So if you guys watch the Michael Jordan documentary, those are my years, and I was at most of those games. And David Stern was my boss. And he used to yell and scream at me so much and so frequently that spittle would come flying out of his mouth. 
And on some twisted level, I thought this was part of what I needed to sort of make my way in the sports business. And I learned a ton. I was at, I was at the NBA for eight years, and I learned a ton there, uh, which certainly helped in the rest of my career. David helped me get my next big gig, which was at ESPN. And I was at ESPN from 1997 to 2017 and ran digital media there. And when David retired after 30 years of NBA, of being the NBA commissioner, and you know one of the finest ever to hold that type of position, he became a venture capitalist. He worked with Graycroft Partners, he worked with Paul Taubman, the banker, PJT Partners. And the last few years at ESPN, out of nowhere, David started calling me all the time. And the reason was he wanted meetings for his little companies that he had invested in at ESPN. In certain cases, he just wanted to know what the little companies did. And for me, you know, some 20 years plus from leaving the NBA that we would be reconnected was really fun and really interesting. And I was very, very impressed by the entrepreneurs that David had invested in. They were bright, um, uh, diverse. Uh, and really moving aggressively. I left ESPN in June of 17, so over four years ago, and the very first call I got was from David. And David said that this work he was doing of investing in and advising these little small sports tech companies had been much more rewarding than what he imagined, that I should consider doing that myself. And for anybody you know, listening to this who's gone through different changes in their career, it's super important to be open to new things. When I left ESPN, the key thing for me was I just wanted to work on projects that I felt passionately about with people I liked and respected. And while that sounds easy and straightforward in life, it's not always possible to do that. So when David started talking about his work, I said, gee, that sounds really interesting. I got done with my deal with ESPN and I went down to see David. David's offices were on 57th and 5th Avenue, right above, right above Bergdorf Men's. And I said, no is a perfectly acceptable answer, but would you have any interest to start doing stuff together? And he thought about it and decided he liked that idea. And so we started doing projects and looking at different companies together. And we essentially sort of informally formalized this idea of a portfolio. And we were thinking about a name. And the one that made sense was Micromanagement Ventures. And the reason was that David really enjoyed being a micromanager and felt, and I, I can tell you this from personal experience, felt that micromanagement was, was, was underappreciated, underrated. And so the idea was we would take 1% in little companies, we would make small investments, uh, you, know, you know, typically five to, five to very low six figures. And our goal was to be the best set of advisors that little sports tech startups could have. And we were focused on sports media, which obviously is a passion of mine, sports betting, which David saw as growing, and player health. David, at one point in our discussion, said he could care less about esports. So I said, well, that's fine. Let's just not invest and spend time in esports. There's plenty of other stuff. And for the little, for the for the founders of these little companies, the idea of having David Stern on their cap table was tremendous. He's a celebrity. Huge. It was a built-in press release. But we had complementary skills because while David knew everybody uh, in the industry, I also brought some knowledge of how media companies, technology companies operate now, how decisions get made. I had a real passion for the detail in terms of, you know, product roadmaps, how people put things together, their decks, their spreadsheets. David, David wasn't big on decks. He wasn't big on spreadsheets, but he was brilliant 
in terms of recognizing quality people. And he was also brilliant, I felt, in terms of looking at different market opportunities and saying, this one's going to be big, but not that one. And the idea behind micromanagement ventures, and I believe this is important in life, was it was also funny. We thought it was a real advantage to having a sort of niche that people could appreciate. I used to joke, and, and it, it, was, it was mostly serious, that we were a little like the producers, you know, the, 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 uh, the play and the movie where we were oh, unintentionally yeah. Yeah. successful. And we wound up investing in 15 different sports tech startups. And all of them are still in operation. One got sold. David would get in a funk when there was a problem with one of the companies. And I'd say, well, this is going to make us the first investors in history who are undefeated. Like, like that never happened. <laughs> you know, most, most VCs were actually serious about what they do. Contrast with David and me, you hope, you hope that two of 15 work and one is right. really big. But David was in a, was in a funk if, if any of them were not performing. And that was the kind of attention that, that he brought to it, which is really great. And when I started working with David, he handed me this list of like, there's a white piece of paper with 10 names of companies on it. And okay. David is like the master marketer. So I said, David, you know, we could use a little merchandising here. This is like 10 names. So um, in my time at ESPN, um, when I was running digital media, there was this hilarious email trail that started with Bob Iger. And basically it was that Ron Conway, who's one of the top angel investors in the world, based in San Francisco, Ron Conway was looking for a contact at ESPN. And when you read this email trail, it was like hot potato. Nobody wanted, no one knew who he was, <laughs> on the list at least, no one wanted to take the time. Finally it gets to me and I said, wow, that's Ron Conway. And what I figured was that Ron wanted tickets and party passes. That's why he wanted a thing from mm -hmm. ESPN, which it turns out is what he did want. But it, when it, I it said, always it always I'll comes be, back to that. When Disney. I said I'll be Ron's contact, I got a bunch more, which is I got access to Ron's world and how he thought. And Ron began to send me his investment sheets, and the investment sheets were were basically these, these, these color charts of each of the little companies, each with their logo, each with a little description. So I showed one to David and I said, we're going to create like a one pager for micromanagement ventures. That's going to have the logos of these little companies. And you, David, are going to come up with a sentence or two to, to, um, um, to describe the company. And this is the kind of detail that I actually learned from him. David, David loved the idea, and we, and we rolled it out. So that's how we got to Micromanagement Ventures. It was, it was very successful. It, it never became a full-fledged firm, a full-fledged uh, fund, mostly because I didn't think David had the temperament mm. to manage other people's money or entertain anybody else's opinion about anything. And... Um, we did this for two years, and then, as you know, David has cerebral hemorrhage on December 12, 2019, and he passed away on New Year's Day 2020, just the start of what was a brutal year because COVID came a couple of months oh, yeah. later. And I have continued that work with the little companies, which has been, which has been, been very rewarding. So that, that's long and windy, but how we got to the name. I... I think it's incredible. And I, I think I remember t you telling me as well that he didn't necessarily know about the name at first. And there was a, a an invoice or something that came across. The oh, desk yeah. And he was yeah. Like, I'm sorry. So um, <laughs> you're good. So, you're good. So um, I, before we started really started working together, I was in the conference room upstairs at David's office and <laughs> David comes storming in. This was like a blast from the past. And he has this piece of paper in his hand. He's waving it in my face. He says, what the F is this? So I look at it, and it's an invoice from Proskauer, which is the law firm that he uses and actually where he came from, referring to David's work as micromanagement ventures because, um, because they, needed a, they needed a code word for their budget. And so, 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 so I'm looking at it, and he says, what do you think? I said, I think it's funny. 
He said, you think it's effing funny? I said, <laughs> I think it's really funny. And so that is, that is, that's how it's stuck. That is how we got to the name. And, and, you know, tribute to David. Um, David had a really good sense of humor about himself. And I talked about humor before. I feel humor in work environments, and this is even more so today, is really important to, to, tr- to try to re- not to take yourself seriously, to try to sort of establish some sort of frame of understanding. Um, and with David, it was always funny. It was frequently off color. David likely would have been canceled today. But for me, his heart was always in the right place. And, um, and humor was a big part. You know, David, David would yell and scream at our little entrepreneurs. And that was like part of the appeal. They were like, you know, they, you, 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 you know, they enjoyed getting yelled and screamed at. But it was always with like a little kiss. And after he finished eviscerating them, he would then compliment them and, and you, know, you know, give them some advice. And so it was all part of the package. Too funny. Yeah, I I think infusing humor into the workplace is something I've I struggled with early in my career because coming out of Disney, I felt like everything had to be this, you know, I mean, working at Disney and ESPN, everything is perfect show has to be the most professional. Um, And and for me, I was always the youngest guy in the room. So I felt like I really had to be extra serious for people to take me serious. I I struggled breaking that. Yeah. I always believed in humor because I think that it's a way of getting people on board with you. I always believed in not taking yourself too seriously. There's a great, um, for whatever reason, my favorite my favorite NBA team is the Phoenix Suns, even though I grew up in New York City. So, so I'm one of the Americans very Good excited year. about the NBA Finals. And they have a terrific coach named Monty Williams. And Monty Williams talks about gratitude, which I think is just one of the most important concepts in life, especially if you have any level of success. And he says, you know, we have a get to job, not a got to, meaning like we don't, you know, it's not like, well, we got to do this. Like it's a privilege to get to do this stuff. And when you work in sports, you get to work in places like Disney or ESPN. It's a privilege, and people people lose track of that. And I think it's really, really important. As a side note, though, I mean, I, this, I don't have any of this. On, we have so many questions on this list, and we're not going to get to ninety percent of them. But I mean, on on that note, I, I do feel like a lot of senior leaders in sports and entertainment have almost taken that mindset too far, and they've forgotten that their core purpose as a leader is to serve. The, their tribe, if you will, whether that be their yes. employees, their customers, whoever it is. And I think sometimes in sports and entertainment, we we get so fixated on the this is a get to role that it's like, well, we can not worry about employee experience at all because this is a get to role and it's next man up. There's 100 people that can take your job outside. The no, I, I think like in digital products, the most important thing is the user experience. So why do you love Netflix or Apple or Google? The experience is mm-hmm. really great. And I tell, you know, especially the, the companies I work with, like your own personal user experience really matters. And that involves listening to other people, being open to ideas, trying to cut through, you know, trying to take advantage of the different points of view that people bring as an advantage Versus a versus a problem, not taking yourself too seriously, and understanding like if you surround yourself with great people, you will find the answers. Then to me, it's really critical now is to have a group of people assembled who rain who 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 represent a different you know a variety of opinions, backgrounds, etc. In my experience, the failures that I was involved with frequently were what you didn't know. You know, that that like we don't know what we don't know. And that's frequently where you walk into the trap. So if you set yourself up in a situation where you have access to a variety of different opinions uh, and you listen to them, you have a much better chance of avoiding the big trap or problem. And some of it is having a little humility about what goes on. The truth is, in a lot of my career, and there are a lot of great successes, many of them, many of them were the results of good fortune. People left and I was able to hire other good people. 
competitors wound up being inept instead of taking advantage of the of their situation. You know, the, the end result was our success. I got credit for it. But the truth is that good fortune played a big, big role in it. Yeah. And I, 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 what, what's the old quote? It's like uh, luck. Luck is preparation meets hard work something like that. Right. right? And you kind of make your own. Um, I, I'm, I'm definitely, definitely a believer in that, but you're right. I mean, so much of success comes down to timing um, and hard work, by the way, hard work. You know, yeah. if, if David were here, David would say hard work is where it starts. And when you work hard, when you work hard, everybody recognizes that. And that's a way of building a connection with your employees, not asking anything of them that you're not asking of yourself. People talk a lot about work-life balance. It's hard to achieve. I'm one of those people who's sending and getting texts at all hours of the day. I'm used to working with international things. And I, I never is apologetic about it. Sometimes I get employees saying, you know, I'm trying to, you know, leave me alone. I'm trying to take my family to lunch. I say, okay, I apologize. You know, just get back to me whenever you can. But, you know, when it's a passion project, that just comes naturally. And that's why in careers, it's really important to sort of try to aim to something that you feel strongly about. Yeah. I mean, no, no question there. It's why we spend a lot of our time with organizations working on really narrowing down what it, and clarifying what is your purpose and how do you align your individual's on your team to the organizational purpose? How do you align yeah. individuals purpose with the organizations? Because everyone's going to be slightly different. But as a leader, you've constantly got to be getting to know your people to say, okay, how can I reframe our organization's purpose in a way that gets this person excited so that they're accepting when I send them those text messages at, at midnight yeah. or whatever it might be? I would just add to and this is difficult. Trust is the essence of every human relationship. I used to really stress with my group, we got to tell the truth, okay? We have to tell the truth frequently in a way that can actually be received by different people and people are different that way. But I used to say, let's have the meeting in the meeting. The thing that would make me mm -hmm. insane was we'd have one discussion and people get out of the meeting and say, can you believe that? And I'm like, no, 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 you got to commit yourself to having that discussion together. And I became like the I became like the body language doctor. You know, I could just tell when people were unhappy, whatever, and it like out with it. And frequently that wasn't pleasant, wasn't pleasant for me, but it cut through it and it creates a culture where, you know, I, I, I. I don't believe that people should be rude to each other. And I think you really have to think again, like how is something going to be received? When um, when I joined ESPN, it was interesting. The management training at ESPN in 1997 was the movie Hoosiers, well, one of my favorite movies. And so we're watching Hoosiers. And if you if you recall, like at the start of the movie, Gene Hackman is in the, is in the locker room and he's trying to get through to his team. He's mm -hmm. like <laughs> going over and over and over stuff. And at the end of the movie, when they're playing the championship game in the locker room, he doesn't, say, he doesn't have to say anything because they're locked in now and they know what they have to do. And the point that the instructor made is this is a ma this is management training. You can't talk to everybody the same way. You have to think about context and other stuff. But I do believe it starts with being honest. It, it's hard to be 100% honest. I, in my last five years at ESPN, we had four workforce reductions. And mm -hmm. I would sit with people who I knew were on the list. And they'd say to me, you know, what do you think? And I couldn't say. Well, I guess I could say, but then I would be violating, you know, the responsibility that right. I was asked to do. So it's it's imperfect. And, you know, some of the people that I didn't tell, you know, don't talk to me today. And I, you know, I understand that I respect that, but I do think you have to start with an essence of trying to create trust in what you're doing. There's a, I think Bezos at Amazon calls it, they, they call it truth speaking, right? Um, and so it's not about being blunt. Or it's not about being rude, but it's about let's have the meeting in the meeting, as you as you put yeah. it. Straight. I used to call it just straight talk. I love like John McCain with the straight talk express, like straight talk. Okay. I love it. And 
And I, I try to avoid a lot of management jargon or coming up with like 15 things or whatever, because people's eyes begin to roll with that. And it's not a test. It's, 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 it, you're trying to get to behavior, right? You're trying to get to the sense. And that, like, um, again, coming back to Monty Williams, mm -hmm. I don't know if the Suns are the most talented team, but they are a team. And they play together and they all buy into the direction that the coach is going. And, and they made use of the regular season. They played through different things. And that, to me, is leadership. It is. It is. Well, let, let's pivot gears a little bit. Um, you're spending – it's in the, this is in the same realm of talking about some of the lessons that you've learned over the course of your career. But I want to look at it almost from a, a future and a forward-facing perspective. Um, so maybe let's, let's turn to your time at ESPN quickly. Um, and is there one project that you guys look back, you look back at and you said, Hey, at the time we thought this was crazy, or you thought this particular idea was crazy, but you look down the road and it's had tremendous success. Uh, it had tremendous success after you guys actually implemented it. Is I'll there one project examples. that comes to mind? Okay, I'll give, two you, that come to I'll mind. give you two quick examples. Okay. okay. Um, one involves a project. So, um, um, I was driving home from Bristol to New York City one day, and Mike and the Mad Dog, the most popular New York sports radio show of, of, of its generation, uh, they were debating whether or not the Knicks at the time should try to trade Stephon Marbury to, um, to the, to, to the uh, Timberwolves for, for Kevin Garnett. And they were trying to figure out whether it could work in the arcane NBA salary cap. So they had their producer trying to figure it out, and they were going on and on and on and on. And I said, well, that's interesting. So I, they go to commercial, and I call up to Bristol. There are a couple of young people, one of whom is named Sachin Gupta, who is a MI, young MIT engineer. And I said, we have the salary cap information from the Players Association in our database. Could we create it? I don't know if I use the word application because this was early. You know, everyone understands apps now. You know, but 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 basically, I want an application that would allow a fan to answer, ask, and get that question answered. And so Sachin came up with something called the NBA Trade Machine, where basically he took the salary cap data and created an easy interface. You could say, okay, here's Stephon Marbury, here's Kevin Garnett. Can we make this trade? And can it work by the NBA salary cap? And from the second it debuted, it was a raging success. Um, I used I used you know, it. I can't tell you how right. many times. Bill Simmons, who was our most popular sports writer and podcaster, referred to himself as the Picasso of the um, you know of the trade machine. One of the funniest things that happened was, and again, I have an NBA background. I got a call from Joel Litvin, who was the general counsel of the NBA. And it was typical NBA, thank you very much. And he wasn't thanking me. He said, Joe Dumars, who then was the president of the Detroit Pistons, just called me and, and asked me how I could reject his trade when <laughs> the NBA trade machine says it's good. He said, then David Stern called and yelled and screamed at me, Joel, because why the F does ESPN have this? And we don't have this. And so I bring it up because I bring it up because this example of you know, understanding kind of a zeitgeist, having a team that's into that, rolling out the right thing, and that just sort of thing that happens. And, you know, like, there were lots of other things I thought were good ideas that didn't work out, but that was one that did. And well, let, let me, it let, let, created a connection with the audience, and it spread virally because it was novel and good and interesting. And... <laughs> You know, you, you, you try to take lessons, you try to take lessons from that. Um, the, the second example is um, we used to have these like town hall meetings every six weeks. And it was kind of like a show and tell. We'd have our group, ads, everybody involved with digital media, and we go through a set of topics. And there is always, you always opened it with research. And the, these were generally happy talk meetings because we had so much success in those days. We were growing very fast. The, the world was coming to the internet. And the research lead for digital media um, gets up and says how we have like 70% share on desktop, okay? And it's going through all the numbers and like we're bigger than everybody else combined. 
And he, then he says, on mobile, we have a 5% lead over Bleach Report. <laughs> and I'm listening to which I go, and I say, can you repeat that? I, I just said, I said, okay, show of hands, how many people here have a smartphone? I knew the answer. Everybody has a smartphone. So I said, that can't be. You know, they're within 5% of us. We have all these advantages, Bleach Report, there's all these advantages. I said, if they pass us on mobile, that's going to be in the New York Times. And right. what I resolved to do that day was move our engineers, our key engineers, off of development of desktop and had them focus on both mobile web and mobile app. This was controversial at the time because the preponderance of the revenue was on desktop. But my gut feeling strong was that consumer behavior was moving to mobile. That seems obvious today, but it wasn't obvious, you know, 10, 12 years ago. And today, ESPN gets 80% of its traffic on mobile, combining mobile web and mobile app. And so I bring this up because as a leader, you have to have a sense of where you think things are going, courage of your convictions, and then be willing to do something about it. It wouldn't have made any difference if I said, oh, okay, wow, that's concerning. You know, let's, let's think about that. You know, like, you know, that was a major problem. And so we wound up sort of fending off Bleach Report and sort of maintaining our big advantage. There are all sorts of ancillary benefits that came with it including you know, development of new services, relevance to young audiences. It was controversial internally. It led to some poor financial performances short term for which, for which I was blamed at the time. You know, like you can be right ultimately, but lose your job. You can be right ultimately, but like a goat at the time. I look back and think that's one of the most important things that we did. Um, and I thought it was pretty, pretty obvious at the time, but those it, it can, it, leadership's a lonely place sometimes. Well, and I, I think, I mean, if you're familiar with the innovators dilemma that Clayton, uh, the book by Clayton Christensen, right? right. That, this is prime example of that, where sometimes as a leader, you've got to skate to where the puck is going and you've got to be willing to cannibalize your current business that's doing well so that yeah. you can succeed in the future. I, I totally agree. And, you know, that that book, Clayton Christensen as a leader, that book, one of the most influential in all business. I'll give you an example. If you, if you read media coverage today, it's all about Netflix and Disney mm -hmm. Plus and Peacock and Hulu. And the real action I would suggest to you is going in TikTok, Instagram, Twitch, yep. services, with interesting content, not necessarily that we would define as high quality, the way we would say Disney Plus or Netflix, that's available to audiences under 30 for free. And it is exploding. And everybody is focused on this other stuff and talking about like blah, 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 blah. blah, blah, blah. And the action, I think, is going on. It's not like the skating of the puck. It's like it's in, it's in another it's arena. And by the time people wake up, at least the decision makers who frequently aren't using the services that are growing, it's 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 going to be um, it's it's going to be a changed world. Well, let, let's talk about some of these these future facing things, these things that are here right now, but are maybe happening in another arena, as you put it. I mean, I'll, I'll use that example on TikTok. I mean, lat, I guess it was maybe two weekends ago. I can think of we were in my in my living room and a couple of my brothers were in town and, and we were talking about putting on a movie and instead we ended up just streaming our phones and showing each other TikToks that we had liked for like right. two hours instead of a movie. Right. And we right. we were crying right. of laughter. And I think those are the things that are happening right now that may, there might be a lot of underneath the surface of what you guys were doing, the algorithm engine for ByteDance, which is a parent company of TikTok is able to get a better and better sense of what you're interested in. While YouTube does the same thing, if you're watching 15 to 20 seconds, you're watching more. That provides more signal, gives them a better idea. 
Um, you know, a friend of mine was lamenting that his wife saw his TikTok and it's all these teenage girls in bikinis, okay? Because that's what he's looking at. And exactly. TikTok knows that's what he's looking at. I would suggest maybe he shouldn't be looking at that, but that's his, <laughs> that's his business. But think about software that is smart and how important that is. We had personalization at ESPN. You know, we'd say, okay, David's favorite team is the Reds. And sure. so whenever he goes on the site, the, the Red score will be there. But it was what I would call, at least at the time, this is four years ago, static, static personalization. The experience is always the same. We didn't know right. if you were looking at box scores or watching videos. It's always the same. The modern product learns from what you're doing and gives you more and better of it. And of course, you know, technology is amoral. So some of this is great and some of this is terrible. There's all this disinformation. There's all this, you know, whatever. No, no. And that's because that's what people are looking at. And they're getting rewarded for looking at it. That, 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 that's a whole separate discussion. But your experience with TikTok, it mirrors my children. My children come home and they're in their bedroom and they're, and they're laying on their bed and they have their phone or iPad there. And they're looking at content from places like TikTok or YouTube, whatever. It doesn't cost them any money, different mm -hmm. duration. The other thing that's fascinating about TikTok um, is that the duration is no longer than it has to be. It was, it was always sort of a foregone conclusion in the world that I grew up in. Okay, a sitcom is 30 minutes. 60 minutes mm -hmm. is 60 minutes. You know, a feature has to be three. Well, not necessarily. Feature could be 21 seconds if it, yeah. if it makes the point. And we have a generation now with, you know, shorter attention spans because that's the way that technology goes. And yet we continue to create content or approaches that don't really reflect who's watching or how they want to watch. Well, let, let's talk about some of this stuff. I, I mean, this is where I feel like you're doing a lot. If I'm, if I'm getting this right, this is where I feel like you're spending a lot of your time now in the advisory work that you're doing. Can, yeah. can you maybe talk to us about some of the more interesting or exciting projects that you're working on uh, in the, in the advisory space right now? Yeah. So I, I view advisory work as it's almost like going to graduate school. And I'll pick out companies or technologies that I think are significant and get involved with them. And it's potentially lucrative for me, but without question, I have a chance to understand new businesses, you know, what's driving them. So, so for instance, I'm a, I'm a board member of a small company in Palo Alto called Eighth Wall. And Eighth Wall does augmented reality for the web versus, say, Snapchat, which is augmented reality for their platform, or Apple, augmented reality for yep. that platform. Snapchat does, uh, excuse me, Eighth Wall does it for, for everything that can be found in a browser. And we've seen an explosion this year with QR codes, you know, in all such forms. And uh, besides the fact that I like the management, my reason for getting involved is I think augmented reality versus say virtual reality, I think augmented reality, use of your phone to see images is really big and important. And I wanted to understand it better. One of the, um, separately, one of the companies that David and I got involved with together is called WSC Sports. And they're, they're an Israeli startup and they use computer vision technology to create and instantly distribute sports video highlights. When I was at ESPN, I was in charge of digital video highlights. And so I have insight into that process and it was heavily manual. We had a room called the screening room. It was the size, uh, this is up in Bristol, Connecticut. The screening room was the size of the University of Michigan indoor football stadium. And everywhere you'd look, you'd see, you'd see workstations with hot and cold running interns all tapping into screens. And they're basically putting in ins and outs into timestamp video. Okay, so David Millay arrives at the arena at 6.15, 18. He goes in the locker room at 6.21, He's on the court at 6.36, 15, he hits a three-pointer at 644, 15. The ins and outs create video highlights for 
ESPN.com, the app, and SportsCenter. And it's a great system. And we thought we had this competitive moat because we could bring in games from all over the world. We had more people doing it. We had better software. Except WSC can do that all through software. Okay, so its software can analyze a piece of video. It can analyze game four of the NBA Finals and say, okay, show me the best plays for Giannis and Devin Booker in the fourth quarter of game four. And it can churn that out in less than a minute with a slate on top of it. And its software is smart. Its software uses crowd noise as an indicator. Its software uses Mm. multiple replays as an indicator. Time of game, score of game. When, it's, it's, when we were doing our system at ESPN, and let's say we had people cutting the New York Jets highlight, mm-hmm. the only difference between the highlight in week 11 and week one was that one person might be better at using the software than the other person was. The WSC software constantly gets better. They're now up to 20 sports. They can use lessons in one sport and apply it to another. And once you cut that clip, they can instantly transport it to any distribution point you know, on the planet. So right. the NBA, which is an early investor in WSC, used to do you know, 100 video highlight clips a night distributed around the world. Now they do 3,000. This enables them to do Rudy Gobert highlights in French in France. And wow. the practical effect of that is mind-blowing. And it gets to a point where real personalization is possible. If you're watching any of the NBA finals, they're taught, they have this campaign running, YouTube TV has a campaign going, and there's this Asian American woman who loves the finals and she shows up late, and, but she can use catch up highlights for YouTube TV. That's her big feature. That's done in the background by WSC. So smart, you know, smart um, software to a modern problem and to tying it back to TikTok, think about how important short form video is in your life and how important it is in your kids. You know, this is just growing. So that's a company that I think is central to content development going forward. My work with them, you know, I'm helpful to them in terms of who I know in the industry, why I think their solution is good. Ideally, if I do my job right and I call you, you're happy to take my call because I'm telling you about something that I think could be helpful to you. Meanwhile, as I watch that company develop and see its, its, its successes and challenges, I get smarter in terms of how to help them or how to assess what's really going on. No, it make, makes a ton of sense. And I, I think with smart technology, I think every organization right now, there are all sorts of process problems or not process problems, but process opportunities that are manual and slow. And we think we've got a moat because we've got more people doing it or whatever, or we've been doing it longer. But the reality is, is that for a lot of these process opportunities, there are solutions in the background that are being built right now, if they already haven't been built, that you can plug in and make your organization a hell of a lot more efficient to focus on what you really are good at and what you're really passionate about as an organization. Right. Um, but I, I, wanna, I wanna move a little bit, and this, it's, it's on this note, I've heard you talk about it in reference uh, together, which is you know about getting those highlights out more often, getting them out faster. But a lot of this comes down to kind of this, this adrenaline factor that is now coming into to sports. We talked about it a little bit as you referenced the, the ESPN trade machine and how fans want to be participating. They don't want to just be passive viewers anymore. And I, I want to, you wrote this great article and I want to read a quote from there to kind of, for you to expand on a little bit, because I think it's really relevant to our audience here. So here's the quote from the article. Over Easter weekend, UCLA lost to undefeated top-ranked Gonzaga in a thrilling Final Four overtime game, one of the best college ball basketball games we've ever seen. Yet the Bruins' epic loss drew just 14.9 million viewers, the lowest ever for the primetime NCAA national semifinal on broadcast TV. Watching a thrilling game was once an amazing, exciting communal activity. Now, for many, it's a passive viewing. And... I think that kind of speaks to a lot of what we're talking about right here, where personalization fans want to interact with the things that they want to interact with, and they don't want to just 
passively view it. They want to actually get involved. So maybe talk about a little bit about how you see fandom changing and how consumers want to interact uh, and what sports and entertainment properties can do to kind of react to this or get in front of it. One of my biggest frustrations, and I'm somebody who's watched sports avidly on television since 1970, okay? And one of my biggest frustrations is that the way sports are televised hasn't really changed all that much. The, the highlight, the cameras are better, the highlight technology is snappier, but it still tends to be two middle-aged white dudes in the booth. We've added a woman to the sideline. It's still the keys to the game. And I think for many, especially in my generation, that's fine. What's lacking to me is choice, and that's what I believe is coming. So for instance, I can watch the Suns play play the Bucks on Saturday night. I'll have my phone with me because I want to look at the box score. Um, but I'm super content to um, I'm super content to watch that and I get fulfilled out of it. I get fulfillment from it. My children will come in and out and if they don't have another device or another experience, they won't stay. So the the creation of some meaningful interactivity to go along with that is, to me, super important. And this gets to the, the sort of ascension of video games in popular culture. Twitch, to me, of all the sort of, sort of modern broadcast networks, Twitch, to me, is the closest to what I think a big part of the population wants and is, and is going to get, you know, our ability to participate in the in the broadcast, to watch it with a friend, to get involved in some form. These things are really, really important. And when I was at the NBA, Red Auerbach, the famous president of the Celtics, was still, you know, you, you know, was still alive. And I would get to the game three hours early and I'd be on the court and Red would come over and he'd share some abuse with me. He's like David. And his thing was he hated the Laker girls. He hated the Nick City dancers. He said, you know what our halftime entertainment is? You know what it is, Kozner? And he'd look at me, sneer. He'd say, we're going to roll out the ball cart. And he used to have Jeff Twist, who was the head of PR for the Celtics, on the game notes, which they'd pass out, halftime entertainment, colon, rolling out the ball cart. And I think our industry, frankly, in a lot of ways, is just rolling out the ball cart. It does the same thing over and over again. It's like, okay, by the time this becomes really problematic, it's someone else's problem, whatever. And very few of the leagues are building the modern experience. I know that the NBA is, you know, they have a whole staff. Their league pass is probably the best of those of those <laughs> sort of out of game, out of market packages. And they're rebuilding the whole thing, you know, and really thinking about what the experience is. I believe everybody has to do that. And the effect, if you look at the demographics of sports, the duration of games at you know, for, 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 you know, for those in the audience listening to this who are involved with, say, college football, college football, because of TV commercial breaks, is practically a four-hour experience now. And, you know, you might have your, your, your diehards who are going to hang in there for that amount of time, but you're not going to have a lot of young audience. You have to figure out ways to, to break the game up, shorten it, figure some other stuff out add interactivity to it. And that way, I think that video games provide a map for what's coming. They, when when esports got going, it was this idea, wow, video games are going to be like sports. And some of that has happened, but I would argue the opposite is what's going to happen. Sports is going to mimic what's happening in games, especially in terms of virtual goods. And we see that with the explosion now of NFTs this year. Um, virtual goods are... Are are the big are the big revenue source in most games that are free to play. These kinds of things are are coming to sports, but they it, it hasn't really been embraced so far by leadership in sports. And I think leadership in sports tends to be older and more conservative. They have a lot to protect and a lot to worry about and a lot of issues on their hands. But this idea that the traditional way that we present our games, especially on broadcast and digital media, the idea that that is going to be sufficient, I believe, is woefully incorrect. 
we we just did a recent episode with uh, fan controlled football. Yeah. And I I thought it was fascinating. Obviously, I think they're still really early. A lot of people still don't know. About but they have what a lot building. of the right ideas, right? I, you know, I, you. I don't I I've watched some of their stuff on Twitch. The the CEO is the CEO is really smart. Um um um, their their head of their head of revenue is really smart. Um, there's no doubt to me that some aspects of fan control football are going to prolif- you're going to proliferate. Yeah, it, it, I think just again going back to this of, of fans wanting to interact, fans actually wanting to participate is a huge thing for for senior leaders in sports and entertainment. Whether they're on the broadcast side, whether they're on the in-person side of things, at the teams themselves and the leagues themselves, I, I think there's a lot of applicability there. Um, all right, so we, we've got a few more minutes here. I, I wanna ask a, just a couple more questions. What's a contrarian view that you have that most leaders in your space don't hold? I, maybe this whole podcast is a, is a contrarian view on some things, but I feel like you're a guy that definitely has a few hot takes uh, that maybe some other senior leaders in the space don't necessarily hold. I just feel in general, complacency, arrogance is really the enemy. And um, sports is wonderful, has all of these, all of these elements that attracted us in the first place. But our situation at the moment is the first time where sports is really being challenged. And the reason is there are just so many things to do. When I was growing up, sports was like color in a black and white world. I would sit, I would, I would stare at my clock, my digital clock, and count down the minutes until the pregame show started. Because I was bored. I mean, I, I wasn't that creative. But um, now... Now, somebody my age as a kid has an unlimited supply of things that he or she can do. So I think sports really radically has to improve its own user experience. I think we really have to focus on getting kids into stadiums and arenas and sharing that experience. Has to be a lot more thought given to to how the game is presented to make it interesting, bite-sized ways of getting people involved. And I, I, I just feel the industry in general is just moving too slowly. John, um, John let, me, let, me, yeah. let me ask you this. I think a lot of leaders listening to this, hopefully everybody listening to this isn't, you know, have, have it, doesn't have that ego, ego that maybe that arrogance, that complacency. Um, but I think there are a lot of senior leaders. I don't think there's any senior leader in sports and entertainment that would disagree with you. But then when you actually hold the mirror up to their own actions, they might be guilty of that complacency themselves. So what's a, what's a good mirror test for a senior leader listening to this to say, is that me? Am I the one that's being complacent and trying to do things the way we always do them? What, what might be a good test for someone to self-realize that, that that's them, that they're the ones that are being complacent? I think it starts with the people who work with you and if you have an honest relationship with them and asking the question, okay? And they might not say, listen, you're a stick in the mud, you're not paying attention, but they might, but they might well say, you know, since you asked, we could be doing the following. Hmm. I think the answer, the answer is in the same way we say like the meeting, have the meeting in the meeting, the answer is in the room. Um, The second thing is, is, you know, any good leader, I think, has external contacts who he or she respects. And you ask them the question and you say, I want you to be brutally honest with me. Mm. You know, you know um, there's, there's a scene in the Titanic where the captain is talking to the, to the ship's engineer. And the ship's engineer says, Captain, there's water in chamber four. So the captain says, well, what does that mean? Well, that means the ship's going to sink. And I used to say, don't tell me there's water in chamber four. You know, like, you know, like when, when, when you know there's a problem, when you know there's a problem, you have to come out with it. That's, you know, good teams, I think, you know, hold themselves accountable. Leader can't do it by himself or herself. You, you, you need the help. But, it, but I think it's, it's, about, it's about honesty, about having access to a network that will be 
straight with you. I think that's the best way. I told you before, like mistakes I made were not knowing what you don't know. So how do you protect yourself mm -hmm. against that? And I think that's where it pays not to be insular, to be open to other things. And the, the path is there. That's uh, I think that's the that's the wrap for me. I was, I was about I to say, I, I think that's a great spot to wrap us. Uh, but any any final words of advice? Where can people follow you? Uh, you're obviously writing a lot of things. You're you're on Twitter. Um, any final words of advice or where can people find you? Um, so I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. I welcome I welcome connecting with anybody in the industry. And um, I I, it, I I the last thing I'd say is I think it's 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 a privilege to get to work in this industry. I I would like to be somebody who could help you know you know move it forward, add some constructive plans for it. But it's a privilege to get to do this work, and I appreciate the time with you guys today. John, great meeting with you. Appreciate the time. We'll, we'll talk soon. Have a nice summer. Take care. Today's episode is brought to you by Checked In, a new tool in your operations toolkit that helps you understand exactly who's working in your venue. It's one of the tech products the engagement team helped create during the pandemic, and with it, we set out to solve some of the key problems sports and entertainment operators face every day. The tool does a few things, from helping you gain more labor data to operate more efficiently and mitigate risk. And it also saves you time and headaches by automating the horrible check-in and credential approval process that has existed for so long. But my favorite part of Checked In, hands down, is that it's tied to a digital learning platform. Now, historically, training game day staff has taken place before the beginning of a season. But how do you train the workers that start mid-season or the workers that just come in to work the big games, the big events? Well, this tool solves that issue. With Checked In, you can create and push training to your teammates digitally, and you can require employees to watch training videos before they're able to physically check in to work. Checked In has begun rolling out at some of the biggest stadiums in the country. If you want to see how it works and get a demo, head to checkedin.app. That's C-H-E-C-K-D-I-N dot app. We'll make it easy and link to it in the show notes. Hey guys, before you head out, just wanted to say thank you so much for listening to the show. If you enjoyed it, head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. That helps more of your peers find the show as they search for ways to get better in their own roles. But this podcast is just a small part of what we do at Engagement. In our normal day in the office, we're crazy focused on helping athletic departments and sports and entertainment companies generate more revenue by becoming more customer-centric. To see how we might be able to help your organization, Visit engagementpartners.com to learn more. Download a free guide, check out our blogs and case studies, or schedule a call with us if you want to see how we can help with your particular objectives. Our goal is to help you create deeper connections with fans and generate more revenue. So when you're with us, hopefully you find a nugget or two that helps your cause.